Welcome to another video for biology. And in this video in biology, I'm going to be highlighting DNA. Uh, more specifically, the story of DNA. How is it that we've come up, we came about the modern conception of DNA? What it looks like, where it came from, the things that it's made out of. To start this story, we need to go back to 1860, or the 1860s, uh, to a humble monk named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel had a passion for studying peas. Okay? So he was a scientist who lived in a, uh, a monastery. He studied peas. He grew peas. And uh, he found something pretty interesting when he grew peas. Uh, for example, when he mixed, when he pollinated a, uh, a green pea with a yellow pea, he noticed that in the next generation that the yellow pea was gone. And he wondered what in the world happened to it. So as he continued to grow these peas, he realized that in the next generation, that yellow characteristic would come back. So a big question that he, that he asked was where and how was this hereditary uh, memory or signal being stored? How was it that the characteristic, the yellow characteristic in the P was disappearing and then reappearing uh, in uh, later generations? So that was a big question that got this whole, this whole thing started uh, in DNA. So that got, the, uh, that got the attention of Thomas Hunt in 1909 at Columbia University. Thomas Hunt noticed something very interesting uh, when he studied the cell. So as Thomas Hunt was looking inside of a cell, he noticed some very definitive features in the nucleus of the cell. He noticed that as the cell was dividing, okay, he noticed that these X-shaped features that he would later call chromosomes, because when he gave them a color dye, they came out very bright, they were very chromatic, so these chromosomes, again, these X-shaped features, um, as they would divide, they actually broke up into, into the exact equal numbers on each cell. So the original cell would have, tw uh, let's say, 23 chromosomes, and the brand new cell would have the exact same amount of chromosomes. So here's where Thomas Morgan looked at, and he said, hmm, this, quite, this might be uh, the feature that I've been looking for as far as looking for that signal that helps to determine the different features of organisms and the pea plants that Gregory Mendel was looking at. So his study continued uh, and he expanded to uh, growing to growing um, fruit flies. Some of the things that he studied in fruit flies was the eye color. He was very curious as to how and where the uh, the gene or this characteristic of eye color in the fruit flies was passed on. Now the reason why he grew fruit flies was because he was able to grow them because it had a very fast reproduction rate and he was able to grow many of them and produce many experiments uh, in a short amount of time. Another characteristic that he paid attention to was the wings of the flies, how they had different wings. So when he was mutating these genes, when he was mutating, when he was able to isolate and identify where these genes are located, he noticed that, that whenever he would mutate a specific area, that the same, the same group of characteristics were uh, being manipulated. And he concluded that the genetics or the genes for these particular characteristics had a linear arrangement. In other words, there, he could identify the exact location uh, for each specific characteristic, and they tended to be grouped together in the chromosome. So for example, if we take a look at this chromosome, theoretically, if he, if he identified this section of the chromosome as the eye color, he could look at a subsequent um, chromosome from another fruit fly, and that same location had the same gene. Likewise, for, let's say, the vestigial wing of the fruit fly, if he wanted to manipulate that particular uh, gene, he could find that in the same location um, in another chromosome. And usually, again, like we mentioned before, if, he, if, if, it affected one, if it affected one gene, it would typically would affect another gene, um, and it would be in the same location in another chromosome. So they were grouped together. They were linearly, they were linearly placed uh, along the chromosome. Okay? And as we mentioned before, he also noticed that uh, the chromosomes from one, from one cell to another were usually identical. Okay, so with this in with this in mind, um, Thomas Morgan wanted to take a closer look at these chromosomes and see what was in them, and he made a pretty interesting discovery. 
He took a look inside of these and he realized he identified the six components that uh, the chromosome was made out of uh, for the most part, or the DNA anyways. Um, he identified the phosphate, thymine, cytosine, deoxyribose, adenine, and guanine as, a com as the main components for DNA. So as great as this um, innovation was, he still didn't know what this DNA molecule looked like. So he had the pieces of the puzzle, but he didn't know how the pieces came together. Along came, and then along came a scientist, P.A. Levine. When he looked at the research that Thomas Morgan made, he made an interesting um, he made an interesting assessment and conclusion of this. And he thought to himself, uh, or he hypothesized that the DNA molecule was making these um, was using these particular components, but they were being organized in a in a repetitive in a repetitive manner. So Pierre Levine looked at this information, and he said to himself, you know, he likened it to having a um, a six-letter alphabet. You know, with only having six letters, you're limited to the the variety of words that you can make, and and hence the variety of sentences and paragraphs and the amount of information that you can convey in just six letters. And on top of that, he also said that well, these mol not not only they're not only are there only six. But they keep; they only repeat. They they exist in a repeating pattern. So if you have a six-letter alphabet, and it only stays in that particular order, and it just repeats itself, then it limits even more the amount of information that these six letters could convey. So thanks to P. A. Levine, the study the study of uh, DNA as the information carrying molecule um, for the various characteristics that we see in nature was pretty much put to a halt and the attention was diverted to proteins. Scientists were now looking at proteins uh, as the main information carrying molecules. And this carried on until the 1940s. When you have a scientist named Frederick Griffith, he came up, he devised an interesting um, an experiment to try to identify what in fact was the information carrying molecule. So what he did is that he made a batch of lethal bacteria and that bacteria he injected into a mouse and as you can guess that lethal bacteria killed the mouse. Okay, So then he made a, a batch of non-lethal bacteria and did the same thing and the mouse lived. And all of this, all of this makes sense. But this is where things got a little bit interesting, is where he had a lethal batch. He heated that lethal batch until the bacteria died. Okay, So the bacteria died. The, he then injected this bacteria into the mouse, and it, he, the mouse remained alive. So even though the uh, bacteria was lethal at one point, once heated and killed, it didn't kill the mouse. So again, this all makes you know, good, good intuitive sense. So he repeated this process by heating up lethal bacteria and he did something different this time. This time he mixed the dead bacteria into a non-lethal live bacteria batch. Okay, And then he injected this same solution into the mouse and it killed the mouse. Now this question baffled Frederick Griffith. Uh, what was it that killed the mouse? Because the bacteria that was supposedly lethal was dead. So how could it how could it come back and kill the mouse? Okay. So as you as you review or you conclude this uh, experiment, he went back to the mice to the mouse the mice and he extracted the bacteria. And in the lethal bacteria, he was able to get, of course, lethal bacteria. And then the non-lethal, there is no lethal, and no lethal bacteria also with the uh, lethal heated. But with the lethal heated bacteria mixed with the non-lethal living bacteria, he was able to extract bacteria that was lethal. Okay, so something was going on here. Something was happening where the non-lethal bacteria was being transformed into lethal bacteria. And he, he surmised that it was the DNA in the bacteria that was being shared or being absorbed by non-lethal bacteria 
that caused the death of the mouse. So along comes another scientist called Oswald Avery. He took the experiments from Griffith and he, like Griffith, was also baffled as to why was this mouse dying? What was causing the death of the mouse if the lethal bacteria was supposedly heated and killed? So what he did is he did the same experiment except he took the mice out of the equation and he just mixed the bacteria. Okay, And he concluded he was able to definitively conclude in 1944, he wrote up, he published a paper with some of his scientist um, partners, and he concluded that it was DNA that was causing the transformation. So in conclusion again, the non-lethal bacteria that was living was able to absorb the DNA of the dead lethal bacteria, thus transforming it into a lethal bacteria and then it killed the mouse.